Fine, thank you. Uh, so uh, without any delay, I will uh, start this uh, webinar. Uh, donc sans délai, sans attendre, nous allons commencer ce webinar. Uh, je vais de, tout d'abord présenter uh, Dr. Marie J. Sillier. Uh, uh, Marie J. a obtenu son baccalauréat en optométrie en 2008 à l'université de Durban, Westville, uh, en Afrique du Sud. Fin, 2000, uh, fin 2016, elle a obtenu un diplôme d'études supérieures en diagnostic et lentilles de contact avancé, CAS, euh, via le New England College of Optometry. Elle a, par la suite, euh, c'est aux États-Unis, et en octobre 2017, elle a obtenu son certificat d'études supérieures en thérapeutique, euh, PGCOT, en thérapeutique oculaire à SUNY University, State University of New York, euh, aux États-Unis. Elle est maintenant autorisée à utiliser à prescrire des médicaments thérapeutiques oculaires au besoin. Elle est également fondatrice de GuruMed, une plateforme d'apprentissage internationale unique et passionnante qui vous propose une formation pratique en soins oculaires. Donc, euh, euh, par la suite, je donnerai le lien si vous voulez vous y inscrire. Elle est l'auteur d'un guide pratique euh, de vision street sur les conditions du segment antérieur, désormais disponible en format Kindle sur Amazon. En 2020, elle a obtenu sa certification clinique auprès de l'association Stark Griffin Dyslexia et est maintenant habilitée à faire le diagnostic de la dyslexie. Elle est devenue membre de l'Académie de l'American Academy of Optometry euh, en novembre 2021. Ses intérêts particuliers sont les maladies et pathologies de la surface oculaire et la gestion de la sécheresse oculaire. So, uh, without any delay, I will uh, leave you the screen and uh, you may start by giving a, a small biography about uh, yourself and uh, about what you are doing in South Africa at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that um, I, I kind of understood that only because I know uh, my background. <laughs> so it's quite nice to hear, um, you know, my background like that in, um, in French. So thank you guys for having me. It's a real privilege to, you know, to be able to do this presentation. Um, I think that um, it's important that as professionals um, across the world, we need to do more of this um, in different countries, you know, so we can have a perspective of uh, what is done in different countries. So yeah, I'm excited. Um, just uh, like what you said, just a little bit of a background of myself. I've been in private practice now for about 13 years. Um, it's nice to see some uh, familiar names on the on the group. So welcome guys. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a passion of mine over the last few years um, in pathology. I practice in a semi-rural environment. And um, the government system is unfortunately overloaded and it's really been a necessity for optometry to step into a gap in ocular surface management. Um, and we were very fortunate to be able to become therapeutically qualified um, in 2017. So uh, the third group is um, on its way with qualification in that. Um, it's quite a rigorous course. So it's been quite a, quite a long time for us to get this, but yeah, we're excited. So we are able to prescribe therapeutically most of the drops that is available and then some oral medication as well. But then what I do want to say on the back of that is that if you are in a country that you do not have therapeutic rights, it still does not mean that you shouldn't know this stuff that we are going to be discussing. So in today's lecture, we're going to talk about um, ocular surface um, therapeutic management, specifically for lids and lashes and conjunctival uh, problems. And then later on in the year, I'll do one on cornea and trauma as well. And the reason you need to be educated on this is even though you might not be able to prescribe it directly, you need to know exactly what you would want to do and to be able to refer to the right places or to be able to co-manage with a general practitioner and actually be in charge of that patient's management, even if you are not the one actually signing the script. So take control of your patient's care 
do that with a lot of confidence and work closely with your primary care providers so that you can actually give the patient the best care. Okay, so I don't want to waste too much time on that. I think uh, we've got quite a lot of material to get through tonight. So I want to get going and we're going to start off with the lids and lash section. Um, and something I want to just disclose. So I am a key opinion leader as well as um, an independent consultant for some of these companies. Um, we are busy developing some great new um, uh, artificial reality and visual reality systems uh, with Vision Wear X. So you guys need to watch out for that. That's going to be amazing. And then um, AOS is a software program that um, does grading, that does Oculus Surface grading. And I will be using that software throughout this presentation. So like I said, I am um, affiliated with them in terms of um, the, the, the talks that I do for and with them. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about GuruMed because I've got a nice little surprise in the store for you guys, but we'll do that at the end. So it's a good reason for you to stay and listen to the end. Uh, Gwati mentioned the book, Practical Guide to Anterior Segment Conditions. I have dropped a link to this book in the chat box. So if anyone is interested, it is available on uh, Amazon in Kindle format and then in South Africa in printed format. Getting it out of the country is always a bit of a problem, but you guys are more than welcome to go and have a look for it on, um, on Amazon. It's a great resource tool for practice and it's, a, it's really a nice and handy desktop guide and gives you all the drugs. We're not going to talk about the drugs in specific names. So in here, you will be able to see all the drug names, both in the Africa region as well as in the Australia, uh, American region. So I give you both. So it depends on what you have available in your country. You should be able to find that in this book. All right, so for the next uh, couple of lectures, when we're talking about surface, I refer to a lot of my symptoms via icons. These are the icons that I use. I will mention them as we go, but just to enlighten you guys a little bit about what they mean. Um, I love imaging because it's much easier to understand. So we'll be talking about them in icons and not um, in written words. So with the uh, lids and lashes, these are the eight um, areas we're gonna be covering. I wanna go through each one of them in their diagnostic sense and then also the therapeutic breakdown. So when you guys walk away, you'll be more comfortable to actually manage these conditions yourself. All right, so let's get into it. Um, and please stop me if there's any questions, please feel free to do so. Um, and if I break up, also please let me know, the signal is not always that good. All right, starting off with blepharitis. So blepharitis, the main signs of blepharitis is this crusting or greasy appearance on the eyelid margin. And then you could possibly and potentially have some corneal, um, um, corneal compromise as well. That's quite common with, um, with chronic blepharitis and more common in elderly patients. So they'll come in complaining of this, this grittiness, this foreign body sensation. A lot of time they complain of a burny eye. The itching is less common than the burn and the foreign body sensation, but it is possible. And then also sometimes the tears is there. Now, the biggest risk for blef and chronic blef specifically is that it can lead into more severe corneal problems. So it's important that patients with blepharitis get managed um, and that they understand that it's generally quite a chronic problem. It doesn't just go away with one batch of treatment. I normally compare it to someone that has like fever blisters. If you have it, you're going to have it. You need to just do something about managing it. Otherwise, it can get out of hand. So what is the management? So we always start with the compresses to um, actually make sure that we get rid of the debris on the lid margin and lid scrubs. Now, be careful with lid scrubs because patients do tend to find them uncomfortable. So depending on what you are using as a lid scrub, if it has a soap base, it can end up being quite uncomfortable and sting the eye when they're actually using it. So something that's become quite popular over the last year has been something like a hypochlorous spray. Hypochlorous also has an anti-inflammatory property. So that is really a great alternative to any form of um, lid wipe or lid scrub. Um, and it really does work very effectively if used every day. Then the next thing you do is you uh, prescribe an antibiotic ointment, especially if it's quite severe and that normal warm compresses and lid scrubs do not remove the scaliness uh, from the eyelid. 
The preservative-free artificial tears is to manage the um, corneal surface and the ocular surface from the toxins and the exotoxins of um, the, the bacteria from the blepharitis. So if you have SPK or something like that, then the tears are there to actually alleviate the ocular surface. Then the next option is your topical antibiotic steroid combination. So what that does is it, it, it completely uh, almost eradicates the problem very quickly. It takes away the itchiness on the layer, takes away the redness, but that is not something that is um, going to be given chronically. Um, it's just in those cases where it's really severe and actually sometimes lid scraps tend to make it worse when it's that bad. So you want to first get, it, get the bacterial load down and then um, by doing a steroid and then um, put the lid scrubs on after that. Okay. And then obviously if um, it's, non, um, uh, it's, it's not reacting and you're struggling to get it sorted out, then you can go over to an oral tetracycline. Now tetracyclines, we're gonna be talking a lot about um, when we're talking about lid care. And tetracyclines are a phenomenal antibiotic when used at low dosages. So normally what we prescribe is something like doxycycline. Doxycycline in low dosages has an, a very powerful anti-inflammatory property as well as the antibiotic property. So you guys will see as we talk further into this talk, we use that very often in uh, gland dysfunction, meibomian gland dysfunction and other things as well. And we'll go through that um, a little bit later. Something I do want to mention with the compresses is with something like blepharitis, you're dealing with bacteria, you're dealing with a possible infection. So your compresses has to be sterile. Whatever you give the patients to use for warm compressing must not be something that they can reuse. It must be something that they throw away in order to prevent secondary infection or them actually infecting themselves. Normally the suggestion is something like, a, you know, those round makeup sponges or um, uh, uh, kind of uh, cloths which they can actually discard after use every time. So that is important to please tell the patient when you are giving them warm compresses for this specific problem. Then uh, tetracycline, so there's contraindications as well. You cannot give a doxycycline to a child under eight years of age and also not pregnant woman. It interrupts bone growth. So it's a very dangerous um, tablet. So please uh, make sure that you are comfortable with your contraindications when prescribing oral medication. Then follow-ups. Normally follow-ups for blepharitis can be quite long after the first initial visit. The patient has a lot of, shall I say, homework to do with their lid scraps. So four weekly is normally sufficient unless there's corneal compromise. If there's corneal compromise, you always want to see your patients uh, at least uh, five days later to make sure that the cornea is actually improving and not getting worse. Remember always to taper your steroid if you're using a steroid and not just to stop it immediately and stress lid hygiene chronically. In these cases, it's like brushing your teeth. They just have to get to a place where they do it every day when they're washing their face. Right, moving on to Shalazion. So Shalazion is by nature a granuloma in the tarsal plate or in the meibomian gland and the tarsal plate. So what happens is the actual meibom goes solid, it, it uh, combines, it goes into a granuloma, it, it solidifies and it ends up just getting bigger. The main um, differentiating factor between this and a hordeolum is the pain. There is no pain involved in chalazion. Normally they are just heavy, but they do not present with pain. So because there's no pain, there's also no infection. This is non-infectious. It's just the fact that the actual oil itself solidifies within the duct, okay? The signs obviously is the lumps, the varying sizes. This one in the picture is quite large, but they vary in sizes. Um, and it depends on how long the patient waits before they come and present to you with, with this problem. And because there's no pain, they tend to wait too long. Um, before they seek medical care. Then again, the management back to the warm compresses and the lid massage. Now in this case, remember I said that it is non-infectious. So in this case, the warm compress does not have to be discarded and they can use something that is something that they can reuse. So something like a face cloth or something like that. 
I generally, I generally like to stay with the discardable ones, whether it's infectious or not, because you, you never know. But um, if it's if they prefer then just using a face cloth in this scenario, they can do that. The idea with the warm compress here is to actually um, make the the oils or the, the oils within the gland uh, more uh, liquid and to break up that granuloma or that lump that's been forming in the eyelid. Now from experience, once it's solidified, it is incredibly difficult to, um, to actually reduce the chalazion with just pure warm compresses and lid massage um, because normally it's quite set by the time that they come in. Then you have the option again of the oral tetracycline. This is effective and it tends to at least reduce um, the, the chalazion by half of its size, again depending on how far they are within that process. Now I've, I've had, I've got in here the topical antibiotic and that is just a prophylaxis. In these cases, normally not necessary, but don't think about the fact that a topical antibiotic in this case will be effective to eliminate the chalazion because it will not. It will not get to the lump and again, it's non-infectious. So it has no effect on the chalazion itself, but there might be a secondary problem that needs the bacterial, uh, the, the, the antibiotic. A lot of these patients also have blef. So you're actually managing those secondary complications rather than treating the chalazion with the topical antibiotic. Now, most of these patients end up getting uh, steroid injections within the nodule. Um, that is still the most effective next to the surgical removal. So in these cases, patient education is key. You want them not to have this recur over and over again. So when they do present, educate them on the fact that they need to continue their warm compresses and their lid massage on a daily basis. And um, then it will not recur as much. And they mustn't wait so long so it doesn't get so big and hard. Otherwise, they will end up having to have it surgically removed. The good news with surgical removal is most of the time it can be done within uh, the chair and, and of, of an ophthalmologist. So it's not a surgical in hospital procedure. It can be done within the consulting room. All right, so now you've given them the warm compresses. You've maybe put them on oral tetracycline and you're trying the, the lid massage. So then you'll see them in three to four weeks, as, assuming that they're doing that at least twice a day. And if at that stage the lesion is still the same or it's not completely resolved, they then get referred uh, for surgical options. Moving on to contact dermatitis. Now this is always quite a, a fun one and a lot of people don't always recognize it because it's kind of confused with allergic. Um, the symptoms are very similar, but the difference between contact dermatitis and allergic conjunctivitis is the lid involvement. These patients have a lot of lid discomfort. They've got a, a, a normally this really periorbital uh, rash area, even it can stretch onto their forehead or onto their nose as well. And it's very often caused by either something that they've touched or an eye drop. And eye drops are very often the culprits. Something like a neomycin, which is an antibiotic, tends to cause contact dermatitis quite, quite easily. Um, so these patients get an eye drop for, let's say, their, their allergies, and they come back two, three days later, and they look worse. They get these really red rings, and everything's just popping out, you know, and there's a lot of swelling with these patients. Their eyelids swell. They can even present with some chemosis as well, and it's normally on both eyes. So the itching is the key thing here with these patients, but like I say, not just in the ocular area, but around on the eyelids themselves. So now here, we're looking at a cold compress versus the warm compress. So let's just differentiate between the two. So in a case like allergic, you want to give a cold compress because you want to actually quiet the system down. You want to take away the blood response. You want to take away the itching. A warm compress is there to actually increase circulation, increase blood supply so that the area can heal itself quicker. With a cold compress, you're taking away the blood supply and you're taking away the inflammatory response to help that eye uh, heal up quicker and to reduce the actual discomfort. 
a cold compress is incredibly effective for an itchy eye. So if you have a patient who's rubbing or a child at school who's rubbing their eyes absolutely crazy, the best thing that they can do is find a cold something and just put it into the orbit to reduce the itching. Uh, you'll give them an artificial tear. The artificial tear is just there to eliminate or reduce whatever the allergen is that's causing the response. So it's just diluting the allergen, making sure that it gets out of the system quicker. Then obviously the topical antihistamine uh, vasoconstrictor combo, that is for the oral or the ocular allergic response. So you're going to have the swelling in the ocular surface. It's not going to have an effect on the eyelid margin itself. So for that, you'll either give them an oral antihistamine, which, wo which works really well, or you can give a topical antihistamine cream as well, making sure that they don't get that cream inside of the eye because it's not made for ocular use. So normally I would just give them the oral antihistamine without the topical, because if they take the oral antihistamine like three times a day, normally on the first day, it's already a lot better. And then, like we said at the end there, there's an option to go with a topical um, steroid ointment for the periorbital area. If there's a lot of rash and the skin has become very flaky, then sometimes you need to just alleviate that inflammation a little bit more with a topical steroid. Okay, so the follow up here again, one week, just to see that there is resolution. You want to make sure that the patient is getting better by, um, with what you are giving them. So if you're only giving them cold compresses and the oral antihistamine, with no steroid and you see them in week one and they, um, the orbit is still very swollen, the eye, eyelid's still puffy, then you might wanna add the steroid at that stage, making sure that you can actually get rid of the reaction altogether. The ideal here is the patient to be able to establish what it is that caused the reaction. That's not so easy to do, but that would be the best, best um, in, in game because you can actually help them prevent it from happening again. Right, now we get into external hordeolums. External hordeolums, or the way we know it as styes. Um, the styes are painful. So this is the main differential between this and um, uh, chalazion. These are very painful. And an external normally presents at the opening or at the top portion of the meibomian gland. And it looks like a pimple. You'll have this little white head, depending on how far it's progressed. It might actually make a, a complete little bubble of, of white pus at the top of the meibomian gland opening. The eyelid in that area is tender and normally a little bit warm, and the patient might have some discharge. Now, the discharge is there because the actual gland itself will express. So the patient will rub the eye because it's a bit painful, and the gland will actually express, and, and, and some of that gunge from the inside of the meibomian gland will end up in the ocular surface. Um, so just here, the signs is the, ter the tender nodule on the lid and the redness and the swelling at the site of infection. Again, this is an, an infectious condition. So what happens is there's uh, a, an infection on the inside of the meibomian gland, which creates this, um, you know, this pus forming on the inside of that gland. Again, here we're looking at warm compressing and lid hygiene. This again should be sterile warm compresses because it's infectious and lid hygiene in the sense of massage. Now, it is very, very effective to completely resolve an external hordeolum or a sty with warm compresses only. I have had, I mean, I've got three kids, so things happen. And I have probably done that effectively with my kids more than once, where you can literally just warm the eyelid up massage it nicely and get rid of that and get that, um, that gland to express because once it's expressing and that gunk can come out, the gland can actually return to its healthy state. And many times you don't even need an antibiotic because the, bod the body can fight it itself as long as that gland is expressing um, you know, to the surface. You then do uh, have the option to add an um, antibiotic ointment that is just rubbed into that area, the area at the top of the gland where the opening is, the antibiotic is applied on there so that it can actually go into the gland. Now, another pearl that I need to share with you is that there's no point of putting an antibiotic ointment on top of a gland that is not open, right? So the patient comes in, they have this sty, it's making this big bubble with white pus and you decide that you're just going to give them an antibiotic ointment. 
Unfortunately, that's not enough because the ointment cannot go into the gland where the infection is actually present. So you need to decap the gland and open it up and make sure you get some of that infectious material out and leave the gland open so that the antibody can actually go in there. And that is also why you do a warm compress so that the gland can stay open and the antibody can get to the infection. Otherwise, it's not going to help. Okay. Follow-ups are not always needed, depending on the severity as well. Um, I tend to always do a follow-up. It's just my nature. Um, I will tend to always see a patient a week later just to make sure everything is fine. But in these cases, the chances of, um, of getting worse is, is not that much. But if you're concerned that it will get worse and you might end up with a cellulitis, rather see them again a week later just to make sure that it is actually improving. Right, so then we go over to internal hordeolum. Now, this is a completely another ball game. Internal hordeolum sits on the inside, middle to bottom um, part of the meibomian gland, so it's much deeper down in the meibomian gland. And very often times, it does not have a white head opening where you can kind of see the gland has the problem. It often uh, protrudes either towards the, the um, inside of the globe, so that the tarsal uh, side of the, the bulbar conch, or it can even express towards the outside, towards the anterior part of the lid. Um, and that, gets, that can be quite severe. That can go into uh, um, orbital cellulitis or a periorbital cellulitis. And these cases are quite a lot more difficult to manage. So the symptoms here actually escalate quite a bit more than with an external. You'll have uh, quite a bit more pain. Patients might complain of headache and the eye itself is quite a lot more swollen and painful altogether. And then you will see the cyst or the swelling. Sometimes you see it as white, but sometimes it's just almost like a chalazion looking bump, but with a lot of redness and a lot of pain. So in this picture, here's a picture that I took of um, an internal, and this one actually ended up um, kind of expressing or um, popping towards the outside, towards the front surface. It actually, uh, it actually got worse to such an extent that it went and it popped towards the front surface. So that's quite common um, with these type of internal hordeolum. Again, lid hygiene and warm compresses, you want to try and resolve the infection by getting it to express. And the only way to do that is warming up the gland and opening up the gland opening so that the infection can try and express, preferably through the gland opening. But if not, then either through the tarsal conch on the inside or then through the front lid on the anterior part. Again, in this case, a topical antibiotic is ineffective unless it is um, able to penetrate that gland, which in this case, it's almost impossible. Um, I do not like opening up internal hordeolum on the inside of the eyelid um, unless it does have a white head where you can actually see that it's wanting to, um, you know, wanting to open up into. But these ones you don't want to fiddle around with because it can spread and create more infection throughout the eyelid. So very often we'll go straight into an oral um, antibiotic um, and an oral tetracycline and doxycycline in this case, which resolves these, um, these hordeolum very quickly and reduces the pain. And once it's reduced, it's easier to do a, a warm compress and get rid of whatever the remainder um, nodules are that is left over. Uh, I just want to run you guys through these pictures that I've got here. So um, on the right bottom picture, um, I use the AOS system, Advanced Ophthalmic Solutions, which is a, a grading and a measuring tool. And what you can do then is you can, in reference to um, your HVID, so you'll see I've measured the HVID on the patient, which is 11.8. And then I can measure any other area on the eyelid in relation to the HVID. So it automatically gives me the measurement on that um, internal hordeolum. Now, what makes that so great is that when I see this patient one week later, I can redo that measurement and ideally it has to be smaller. So if it's not or it's larger, then you know that it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Now with experience, you can do it with your own eye. I mean, we, we can see if, it getting, if it's getting better but it's really great to have the software available there you can actually have measurables next to each other and have data 
that you can follow up and make sure what you're doing is actually being effective. So in this case, again, you'll see them in one week's time. And this is where, and I've said it a few times now, we need to monitor for possible preceptal cellulitis. Um, and that is, a, that is a, an emergency case. You do not want a cellulitis case um, that presents from here. What will happen is the whole eyelid will start to get painful and swollen and red, and that patient might need to be admitted. Okay, going into my Bowman gland dysfunction, and this is a common one um, and I believe you guys in this group has had quite a bit of discussion um, around dry eye. So my Birmingham gland dysfunction is a very big topic of discussion and something that I have spent a lot of time on myself. And it is actually a lot more common than we think. Um, I always say that, you know, eye care has kind of dropped the ball um, with eyelid management because we should be caring for our eyelids the way that we actually brush our teeth. And if we can keep the meibomian gland openings healthy and open, then we will not end up with meibomian gland dysfunction. And this is really becoming a big problem. I'm seeing it younger and younger. My youngest, um, and I actually picked it up in my own child, to be honest with you guys, um, she was seven and she had about a grade, uh, I think it was about a grade one dropout um, and atrophy of her meibomian gland system at the age of seven. So there's a lot of questions around why I can't give you those answers, but what I can say is that we need to be um, on top of this. As optometrists, this is something that I believe we should be doing um, with every consultation. We need to check patients' membomian gland system and make sure that we train them on how to manage their eyelids. Okay, so symptoms here again is dry eye related. So the grittiness, the burning, the tearing, and then sometimes the itching, but it's really more the, the dry eye um, uh, symptoms like the burning and the gritty sensation. They, these patients present with the capped gland. So there's um, keratin from the skin that actually caps over the meibomian gland. Because of that, there's an oxygen deficit at the gland opening and um, the eyelid then grows blood vessels, uh, that telangiectasia vessels into the eyelid to help with the oxygen problem, but those vessels actually then block up the glands even more. You might find that when you try and express the gland just by pressing, it'll be white and thick, maybe toothpastey, or there will be no expression out of the gland. And then the worst part of this is the actual meibomian gland dropout or atrophy. In this picture on the side, you can actually see there's quite a lot of dropout and atrophy and it can really, really affect a patient's quality of life. <clears throat> so again, what do we do here? And the lid management is key. We have to, have to, have to train people on putting warm compresses on their eyes at least every night and scrubbing their lids to get rid of the excess keratin and make sure those glands are open because if they're open, the meibomian glands can work uh, fully. Antibiotic ointments is an optional, um, but again, this is reserved for cases of a blef and infection. And meibomian gland dysfunction is not necessarily infective. So um, I normally reserve the antibiotic ointments for the blef uh, and patients that got some form of infective component as well. They will need artificial tears to be able to assist them while you are managing their gland structure because they are going to have a decrease of oil in their tear structure. The topical steroid works well to reduce the uh, inflammation on the lid, to reduce the telangiectasia on the lid margin and help the gland openings just to function a little bit better. And then again, if it's unresponsive, you will go into the oral doxycycline. Um, and uh, I, I can't remember if I said this, but oral doxycycline has a great anti-inflammatory property. And what that does is it'll actually relieve the inflammation within the gland making it function better. So the review here is a little bit longer, three to four weeks, because the patient really has to go home and do their lid scrubs and compressing. And then you can reduce the scrubs to uh, once a day to make sure that it's maintained. And again, once a day chronically. Something I haven't added on here, which is a very important point is um, omega-3. Omega-3 is a must supplement, I believe for everyone. Um, but what the omega-3 does is it helps um, uh, improve the anti-inflammatory components from the inside of the body and helps keep the meibomian gland system a little bit healthier as well. 
Right, that takes us into preceptal and orbital cellulitis, hopefully one that we do not get to see that much of. Um, in terms of therapeutic management, we are only going to speak about preceptal cellulitis because orbital cellulitis is seen as an ocular emergency. They need to be referred to the emergency room, they need to be put on IV because that is really very site threatening. So the main component of preceptal and orbital cellulitis is the pain differentiator, is a lot, a lot of pain, severe headaches, and oftentimes double vision when it goes over into an orbital cellulitis. So when a patient presents with a painful, swollen red eye with double vision, you really have to think in the lines of an orbital cellulitis. Now, this table actually differentiates the two very nicely from each other. Um, you have a lot of similarities where you have the eyelid edema and the warmth, okay? You have um, some hyperemia in the conjunctiva with preceptal, but it goes into a full-on chemosis with an orbital cellulitis. Now, the, the main difference between the two in orbital cellulitis, you have a few other things that will pop out, which is one is proptosis. The eye might be protruding then you'll have a reduced ocular motility, which is what's creating the double vision, or it's restricted motilities. You might have a afferent papillary defect if it's gone into the optic nerve and you then end up with a neuritis, and you might have a visual acuity a decrease in orbital cellulitis as well. So you can see how this is a really much more severe and much more dangerous problem than just having a preceptal cellulitis where you have a front surface or an anterior segment problem. With orbital cellulitis, it's actually containing the whole globe and it's really site threatening. So how again will we manage uh, preceptal cellulitis? And preceptal cellulitis is just the more severe form of an internal hordeolum and it'll take up the whole lid. The whole lid starts to swell, the whole lid starts to get painful. It could even extend onto the eyebrow and onto the cheek margin. This whole area tends to swell up more so than with an internal. Um, from my experience, and this is quite um, interesting, but most preceptal cellulitis I've seen has been um, because of insect bites more so than from an uh, uh, internal hordeolum. Internal hordeolums tend to contain very well, um, where with insect bites, there's some form of um, infectious spread that happens with that where uh, that doesn't occur with internal hordeolum. So you can ask these patients, listen, maybe have you been bitten by a mosquito or by something, you know, and very often um, you might be able to even see the mark, uh, a single a prick mark, where um, that infection might have occurred. Um, and so again, with these cases, you'll probably go straight into an oral antibiotic because you cannot treat this topically. You want to get the swelling and the infection down as quickly as possible. And then the topical antibiotic is there for secondary infection um, because you might have this chemosis or the hyperemia and you might have a secondary um, bacterial conjunctivitis depending on the reason for this infection which you'll then manage topically. Now with these patients, you will definitely follow them up very closely and much more, um, much, uh, much more recently. So I normally see them every day until I have at least a 50% improvement. So I can make sure that this does not switch over into a full-on orbital cellulitis. So you see them every 24 hours, at least for like the first two or three days. And once it starts to get better, you can then see them once a week until it's um, uh, resolved. Okay, and then the last, uh, the last one for the lid section is trachoma. Now in South Africa, I have not um, had the, I don't know if I wanna say privilege or disprivilege to see a case myself, but in higher Africa, I do know that this is a lot more common and some of you might have actually seen this. Trachoma is called river blindness. It's because of um, fly vectors, which create scarring in the actual eyelid itself, creating this trichiasis. And the trichiasis is the thing that causes the problem. It's causing corneal scarring and blindness because of that. You know, um, It normally starts with pain the moment that the lid scarring causes the trichiasis. And then after that, the pain is less severe, but you have a discharging eye, you have poor vision, 
um, and you have the itching and discomfort that comes with the constant rubbing of eyelids on the corneal surface itself. So signs here, um, it makes a fol follicular and papillary reaction. It's quite a combined reaction. There's a lot of SBK because of the actual abrasion on the corneal surface. Panis is obviously very common because what happens is, is the superior scarring of the tarsal conjunctiva causes friction on the top limbal area, which creates this uh, panis. The trachiasis and the entropion, the corneal ulceration because of the trachiasis, and then obviously the opacification and the Herbert's pits as well. So this is a manual or a mechanical trauma to the eye because of the scarring of the eyelids themselves. Hmm. So what is the management here? So the main management is an oral azithromycin. Azithromycin is an antibiotic that um, kind of completely resolves the vector, the fly vector infection that these patients uh, deal with. And it's a once off application. So they literally give them one tablet and normally that um, kind of completely eradicates uh, whatever infection is remaining. The problem with this is that the scarring does not go away. Um, and the trachiasis has to be surgically fixed, which in very rural areas is very difficult to do. And very often these patients already have a, a loss of sight by the time that they actually seek medical help. Okay? Um, research states that you can check them up in two to three weeks, but ideally these patients should get one dose of azithromycin once every six months just to make sure that they don't have a reinfection of, um, of the flies, you know, which is, which is also a, an environmental problem that doesn't really go away. <clears throat> okay, so that's the section on lids and lashes. While I swap over to uh, the conjunctival section, um, is there anyone that has a question? You, also, you guys are welcome to, to pop that into the chat box. How are we on time? I don't want to keep us too long. <clears throat> So please feel free to uh, put some questions in the chat box if you have any. <clears throat> Let me just find the other presentation. There we go. Okay. Can everyone still hear me all right? Just give me a thumbs up or an okay and everyone's still with me. I haven't fallen asleep yet. I know this is uh, quite a lot, but um, I hope everyone's still with me. <clears throat> okay. Yay, I get a thumbs up. Thanks, Gooks. All right, so let's get going into uh, conjunctivitis. Now, conjunctivitis is definitely, uh, in all forms of it, one of the most common things that um, optometrists will see in practice. It's something that I think I deal with the most, um, especially some of the more severe ones. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. Uh, Sorry, let me just get my mouse working here. There we go. All right, so again, we're gonna go through um, eight different um, conjunctivitis or conjunctival conditions, which I wanna discuss with you guys. Um, so let's get into it. So allergic conjunctivitis is uh, on top of that list. You are going to see allergic conjunctivitis more so than anything else probably in eye care. This is so common, it's just crazy. Okay, so we need to know how to deal with allergic conjunctivitis. The symptoms are the itch. So the itching is the main thing, uh, the redness, obviously, but I have found that some patients have red, red, less redness than others. Um, and then the teariness as well. And I want you to keep this in mind because I'm gonna just do a comparative later on between allergic bacterial and viral. So just keep in mind what these symptoms look like because we need to differentiate between those three. So signs of conjunctivitis, normally you have this conjunctival and eyelid redness or hyperemia. You can have chemosis. Some patients really have bad conjunctival chemosis. Um, you'll have the papillae and some mucoidal discharge. Now that's almost like a stringy discharge. Patients will say it's almost like a, like a sticky stringy discharge that they experience. And very often allergic conjunctivitis is binocular. It's not common. That, um, uh, that the conjunctivitis is just um, uh, unilateral, you know, because it's seasonal or it's uh, something, you know, that they've uh, inhaled or eaten and it kind of gives you this binocular uh, type of um, uh, conjunctivitis. 
So how do we go about managing that? And you guys will see, we're still on the compresses. Compresses are great. And again, we're doing cold compressing. Cold compressing to help with the itch, to help with the swelling. It really is very effective to reduce um, the inflammation because it takes the blood away from the eye. You will then give them a topical antihistamine Marcel stabilizing combo. Now, why do we do that? Marcel stabilizers are not quick to work. Marcel stabilizers are therefore more long-term solution to allergies. So you want to give them both. The antihistamine will fix the now reaction and the Marcel stabilizer will make sure that it continues to uh, alleviate the allergic reaction over time. So uh, something like patinol is probably one of the most common drops that's used in this class. If it's really severe then, and you have this really severe chemosis or eyelid edema, then you can go to a topical a steroid, um, normally in a drop form, because the, the ointments make the eye even more sticky. So you want to try and stick to a drop form. And then obviously oral antihistamines work really well as well. Your follow-up will be two weekly and taper the steroid. Always remember to taper your steroid. Um, and then if it's a chronic problem, then you need to have the discussion about chronic management, how to go about chronic management, what drops are safe. Something that I battle a lot with with my patients is having to have the discussion of, um, can I say, bad drops, you know, stuff like Sapphire Blue, stuff like Igene. Um, you know, the, 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 the pure vasoconstrictor drops, which patients use because it makes their eyes look so good, but it's not necessarily the, the best way to go. So always ask your patients, what are they using? Try and take them off their vasoconstrictors as quickly as possible and put them onto something chronic, which will probably alleviate both more successfully over the long term. Then we go to bacterial conjunctivitis. And here the main differential is the discharge. So where with allergic, you have almost like a stringy um, mucoidal type of discharge. With bacterial, it really gets gunky. It gets, it almost looks like they've put some form of ointment in their eyes. It's got this sticky white discharge. Remember that they will clean their eye. So when they get to you, it might not look as discharged as it probably would be first thing in the morning when they wake up. So you want to ask them, what is the discharge like when you wake up in the morning? Is it very white? Is it maybe yellow? Or is it only uh, slightly limited? You know, Because they, they, the fact that they're cleaning their eye might lead you to think that it's not bacterial because you might not be seeing so much of that discharge. A bacterial conjunctivitis leaves the eye a lot more red and a lot more um, uncomfortable, kind of gritty, than an allergic does. There's less itching in this case, or almost no itching. There's a pain factor, a foreign body factor, and then the discharge factor. Bacterial conjunctivitis is actually very uncommon. It's very hard to get this. And a lot of um, opticians tend to uh, make the mistake of diagnosing it as bacterial, when um, it's really not that easy. These are common in patients with chronic blepharitis and normally elderly patients. And it's actually quite a big risk because for those patients, you have a very large chance of uh, developing a corneal ulcer because the ocular surface is really very um, compromised. You know, they've got the, the, the dry surface, they've got the bleph, now they've got the bacterial conjunctivitis, which is an opportunistic infection, and it very, very quickly can lead to very bad um, corneal ulcerations. So the management here is obviously topical antibiotic. Um, I don't fiddle around with bacterial conjunctivitis. I normally go straight into a, a high a level or a, a stronger antibiotic drop, something like a fluoroquinolone especially when I'm dealing with an elderly patient with other, um, with other comorbidities. Um, and you want to really try and eliminate that bacterial load as quickly as possible. So um, I would probably do an antibiotic drop, something like, um, now we've got uh, Besivance, which is Besifloxacin, one of, the, one of the fluoroquinolones. And then at night, you can add an ointment, but... These patients already complain that their eyes are sticky, that they've got this discharge. So they really dislike the antibiotic ointments at night because it makes the stickiness worse. And you cannot gauge whether it's actually improving. So 
I do not always give them the antibiotic ointment um, unless the cornea is compromised. If the cornea is compromised, you want to have something in that eye while they're sleeping. But if the cornea is fine, then you can really um, leave the ointment out and only go with the drop um, during waking hours. And then again, the eyelid and the eye hygiene, they need to keep it clean. They need to change their pillowcase. They make, make sure everything is staying clean so they don't reinfect themselves. In these cases, you also want to follow them up a bit more closely. Two days, it has to be improving. The redness has to get better. And you have to see that the cornea is not getting worse. And then one week to resolution. In these pictures, again, you can see the grading. So in the, in the bottom right picture, the hyperemia grade is sitting at a 3.6. So it's almost a grade four hyperemia. Again, what I would do is when I see them for their follow up two days later, I would take the same photograph, put it into the software and recheck how bad the hyperemia grade is. And it should have improved after two days. All right, going into GPC, this is specifically contact lens induced GPC. So this patient will be a contact lens wearer. And the first thing they come in complaining of is the fact that their eyes itch and there's a lot of discomfort when they remove their lens. So the moment they take their contact lens out, their eyes are scratchy and their eyes are uncomfortable. And what happens? They wear their lenses too much because they are so uncomfortable. So they end up over wearing which makes the GPC even worse, okay? It can get to a point where they have a discharge, more of a mucoidal and a stingy, a stringy discharge like with allergic rather than a mucopurulent discharge um, like with bacterial. The vision can be blurry because these patients will oftentimes um, also rub their eyes quite a lot and then the burning sensation. Now, the key thing here is you have a contact lens wearer flip over that top lid. Have a look at what's going on underneath that top lid. It'll tell you many stories once you have a look underneath. Um, and you'll actually see these paving stone uh, GPC um, papillae underneath the top lid. So in these cases, the biggest challenge I experience is the fact that, number one, the patients don't want to get out of their contact lenses. They really do not want to not wear their lenses. And secondly, you can't give them a drop that they can use with contact lenses. So they end up having to use their drops or they end up using their drops less because they still want to be wearing their contact lenses. It's something that has to be explained to the patient as well as possible. If they can adhere to being out of their lenses for three to four days, you can actively manage them with drops every two to three hours and hopefully get rid of the reaction quicker. Whereas if they continue to wear their lenses, that recovery time get, becomes a lot longer. So have the conversation and say, you know what, just let's do a week, get you in your drops, get you comfortable so that you can get back into your contact lenses. So with GPC, I haven't found that um, antihistamines are really effective. You end up having to pull in a steroid to make it better, especially because we are living in the um, fast food era where everyone wants solutions like right now. Um, so that definitely works a lot better to get that eye um, comfortable a lot quicker. But I will keep them on uh, antihistamine mast cell stabilizing combo afterwards, so which they can use then before they put their lenses in and after they take their lenses out. But the key point with contact lens GPC is the problem here is the reaction to the contact lens. So they're either having a reaction to the contact lens material, they're either having a reaction to the contact lens cleaning solution. So you have to figure out which one of those it is. Normally, it's a silicon allergy. Some patients are very sensitive to silicon. So you end up um, having to take them off their silicon hydrogel lenses and put them either in a pure hydrogel or in an RGP. And what happens then is the, the GPC resolves um, quite, quite quickly. I normally do not change both. So don't change your lens material and your cleaning solution at the same time, because you're not going to know which one was actually the culprit. So choose one and decide, okay, so I'm going to change the lens material. So do that only, but keep the cleaning regime the same. And if that then doesn't work, then change the cleaning regime or do the cleaning first and then change the contact lens material. Um, because if, you, like I said, if you do both, you're not going to know which one was actually the problem. These patients you want to review, 
I normally, again, check them in a week's time because I try and take them out of their lenses for a week. And I want to see them before they start wearing their lenses again and refitting them at that stage with a new set of lenses um, so that we can make sure that the eyes are ready for that. Okay, going into episcleritis and scleritis, again, um, a more common, um, uh, no, let's say a less common problem in, in eye care practice, but something that is actually popping out a bit more um, in my practice lately. Episcleritis is inflammation of the episclera. Um, the patient presents with redness and dull pain. So like a dullish, achy pain, also sometimes a little bit of tearing. Now, the redness can be sectoral very often, but it can be diffuse as well. But most often, it is sectoral. You'll find it in a specific um, uh, area of the, of the episclera. Now, the best way to differentiate the two is obviously with phenylephrine. You will actually put a drop of um, phenylephrine into the eye. And if uh, the phenylephrine actually takes away the hyperemia completely, or at least more than 50% so, you're dealing with an episcleritis or a conjunctivitis and not scleritis. When you put it in and it doesn't go away or it doesn't change, then it's a deeper problem and usually a scleritis issue. How do we manage episcleritis? Now the artificial tears are there just to improve comfort, but you will have to give them a corticosteroid. You need to eliminate the inflammation and that's the only way to do that. Um, and the pain can be managed with an oral NSA. Now, this is a good time to speak about oral and topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories have the habit of creating corneal melting or corneal um, thinning in uh, dry, dry eye patients. So, and that's for topical, sorry, topical NSAs can do that. So I'm very cautious when I'm using topical NSAIDs for pain management, because you have to be careful in terms of what that can do on the corneal surface. I will very, very often, well, actually most of the time, revert to using an oral NSAID for pain rather than a topical, because it's really a lot safer to go that route. So you'll only do a topical steroid, and then you will give them an oral anti-inflammatory to help them with the pain. You review them in two weeks and you taper the steroid at that time. It's always good with these patients to have the conversation about the possibility that this is systemic, but you will only do that when the episcleritis is recurrent. Some people can have an episcleritis episode once in their lifetime. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them um, systemically. But if they end up produ uh, producing an episcleritis on a more uh, frequent basis, you want to make sure that you send them for inflammatory blood workups to make sure that there's no systemic component involved. Then we go into, epi uh, into scleritis itself. And again, scleritis is more of an emergency because it's deeper tissues that's involved. And scleritis is usually associated with some form of um, uh, systemic inflammation conditions. Something like lupus or sarcoidosis um, can cause uh, scleritis as well. The differentiating symptoms between these is the pain. Scleritis is incredibly painful. And a lot of these patients say it doesn't matter what they do, no matter how many tablets they drink, it really does not bring the pain factor down. So these patients are in a huge, huge amount of pain. You will see that on the scan, again, with the software, the redness is a full grade four. There's a lot of hyperemia, um, and that is also a lot different, and it's quite diffuse compared to the sectoral part of episcleritis. Having said that, you can get sectoral scleritis as well, so don't think it's an episcleritis just purely because it's sectoral. Use your phenylephrine to differentiate between the two. The signs are the inflammation, the inflammation of the sclera. You oftentimes have anterior cell um, or anterior chamber reactions as well. So you end up having a uveitis. You might have nodules, scleral, scleral nodules that um, develop. And sometimes you can also have a raised IOP. So if the scleritis uh, uh, is not just a surface or anterior surface, but it actually spreads into the posterior pole, 
then you can have a trabeculitis, you can end up with retinitis, and you know, this can really start getting quite bad if it's not managed properly. In management, we're talking about the non-necrotizing, non-infectious ones, so the inflammatory scleritis that's managed with a high-dose corticosteroid and again oral NSAIDs. I always refer my scleritis patients out for co-management because you need to make sure that there's no other systemic involvement and that it doesn't spread into a retinitis, which can be site-threatening. So I will put them on the initial dose of treatment and send them out both to an ophthalmologist as well as a rheumatologist, just to make sure that we check their blood work up and make sure everything is fine. Again, you'll see them, I again see them in a week's time, making sure that their um, inflammation is improving. Um, and then remember, always remember to taper your steroid. Okay, then we go into pterygiums and pinguicula. Again, very common. Um, so when we're looking at, oh, sorry, I'm going to go back. Let me just go back there. There we go. When we talk about um, pterygium and pinguiculum, these are um, highly symptomatic. So a lot of these patients complain of the foreign body sensation uh, first. And then you have the cosmetic problem with that as well. So you have this red bump, pinguiculum does not encroach onto the cornea and pterygium then actually makes this wing-shaped growth onto the corneal surface. The redness obviously again is sectoral on the area of where the actual growth is. Um, and then with contact lens patients, you might have a lot of discomfort on that bump where the pinguiculum or the pterygium occurs. Just get there, there we go. So there's a nice picture of a quite severe pterygium. Um, this patient specifically um, did not know that he could actually have it removed, so he just left it. And at this stage, his vision was quite uh, affected. I mean, it created quite a lot of corneal astigmatism. And as you can see, there's a leading edge. So I want to just show you guys that because I don't know. So with the pterygium, you have, <clears throat> you have the actual main pterygium or the growth edge, which is there. So I'll show you guys. There's the growth edge of the pterygium itself. And then you have a leading edge, which is the scarred area where the actual stromal tissue of the cornea starts to go cloudy. And in this patient, you can actually see there is the leading edge of the pterygium itself. So you can imagine in this case, I mean, the patient is having this complete shadow. So he was presenting with this kind of hazy um, uh, crescent shaped shadow in his visual field. And at nighttime, it was very bad because the moment those pupils dilate, he was actually looking into the fibroid tissue of the pterygium itself. Even on removal, the patient was still symptomatic because it was still leaving a scar over his visual axis. So the idea with pterygium and pinguiculum is to keep them quiet, is to keep them uh, from growing. And that is possible with artificial tears and then later on with maybe low dose um, steroid drops. <clears throat> because if there's no friction between the eyelid itself and the bump, and there's no rubbing there, then there's no aggravation and inflammation. And if there's no inflammation, there's no growth. So you can really very easily keep a pterygium under control with regular artificial tears and then the occasional topical steroid. When then it gets to a stage where it's too bad, it has to be surgically removed. If you're putting the patient on drops and you're putting them on steroids, you will review them in two weeks time. And like I said, you have to stress the chronicity of this condition that they have to put chronic lubrication in to make sure that it doesn't get worse. All right, subconjunctival hemorrhages, probably the one that looks the worst, but that has the least amount of um, ocular complications. These patients come in complaining that their eyes look terrible. They're very scared normally. Uh, there's a lot of blood in some patients, especially if they are using some form of blood thinner like warfarin. Um, and they're really very scared when they come in. But the signs and the symptoms of this is the fact that you've got the hyperemia or the redness. There can be a slight bit of foreign body sensation because the pooling of the blood itself can create a bit of a swelling or a bit of a, 
kind of uh, a bulging of the conjunctival tissue, which creates that little bit of foreign body sensation. Um, and then um, the main thing here is that there's no uh, affected vision. The patient does not have a reduction in vision, which is very important. And that's the thing that you will keep them um, feeling better about. So you will tell them, okay, don't worry about it. You, your vision will be fine. This is not something that's actually going to affect your vision, but um, this is what's happening and this is what's going on. In terms of management, um, very often I don't actually want to give them something, but patients always feel better when they have something and they feel that you actually have treated them. So you will just give them an artificial tear to help with the, dis with the little bit of um, discomfort that they um, uh, might be feeling. And then uh, something you wanna do is you wanna check their blood pressure. You wanna see if there's an associated problem that might have caused the conjunctival hemorrhage. Educate them, explain to them what has happened, explain to them that they might have coughed a bit hard or they might have picked something up which increased the pressure in their head, which caused the blood vessel to, to, to actually fracture. Something you don't want to give in these cases, again, is a vasoconstrictor. So the eye has the ability to reabsorb this blood by doing that with the blood vessels. If you're going to give a vasoconstrictor, it will actually uh, lengthen the process. It'll actually make the, the recovery process longer because it, it takes away the eye's ability to absorb the blood um, because the blood vessels are constricted. So please never ever give these patients a vasoconstrictor of any sorts and also do not give them cold compressors because cold compressors has the same effect. It actually closes blood vessels up and makes the process longer and the patient will end up having this red eye for a longer period of time. This picture, you can see it looks quite bad. Um, this patient specifically is on warfarin and quite high doses of warfarin. So she had a minor uh, conjunctival hemorrhage and it ended up looking terrible. You know, it had this whole big sack of blood underneath in the, in the, tarsal, con uh, in the tarsal area. And yeah, she was very concerned. Something else that you might hear patients ask is, oh, don't you want, to, shouldn't we drain the blood or puncture it? Please don't ever do that you just opening it up for a possible secondary infection. You leave it as is, no matter how much blood is pooling in the conjunctiva, rather leave it to absorb itself because you do not want to open up that area for a possible secondary infection. You don't need to follow them up um, unless the patient really wants to see you. But in these cases, normally it takes quite long, up to 14 days or three weeks for it to resolve completely. Again, educate your patient that it takes quite some time to resolve. Okay, and then vernal conjunctivitis is probably one of my, uh, again, I use the word favorites, but this is, this is one of the things that I see a lot of. And unfortunately, we still see a lot of blindness because of a condition like vernal. Now, vernal conjunctivitis is a, an allergic problem mostly seen in hotter climates and again still with uh, boys but it can vary it really doesn't in my environment I've seen it in both uh, sexes both girls and boys alike but I have found in my environment it's very much a dust um, a dust dependent thing so the, the children that live in rural environments with dust and fire and smoke they tend to have this uh, quite a lot. So the itching, that is the main thing. The itching, these children rub their eyes so badly. And it's the rubbing that creates the scarring. Because what the rubbing does is it creates friction on the ocular surface, which creates damage to the stem cells around the limbal zone. And that creates the scarring that encroaches from the outside. And as you can see on this picture, that patient has quite bad corneal scarring on the periphery, um, and um, his other eye actually was almost completely uh, scarred over. And he was, I think, about 13 um, at the stage where we saw him like this, you know. So this is a very difficult one to manage, a very difficult one to uh, keep under control. And from experience, I can tell you nothing does the job like a steroid does. And everyone is very scared to give these children, um, you know, steroid drops. But uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about the signs. 
So in terms of vernal, the most common sign is the, um, the uh, papillae or um, uh, the, it normally makes like a GPC if it's a tarsal form under the top and bottom lids. And then the trantus dots. So you get these dots around the limbal area, which almost looks like sores. And what it is, is it's um, immune response, eosinophil um, nodules that form um, on the limbal zone, trying to help with the inflammation that is on this eye itself. Again, you'll have a bit of discharge, mucoidal discharge, very similar to allergic because again, it's an allergic form. So you might have the similar allergic um, mucoid um, in the ocular surface. Okay, so like I said, management, yeah, management is hard and, and everywhere you read textbooks will say, you've got to start with your antihistamine mast cell combination. I can tell you from experience an antihistamine doesn't touch this. You're not going to get rid of the itching. You're not going to get rid of the inflammation. You're definitely not going to get rid of the rubbing. So um, I normally give a corticosteroid antibiotic combination. The reason for the combination is you very often have a corneal insult. So you'll see with this picture, there's diffuse SPK, and that's because of the rubbing. These kids are rubbing, and the whole epithelium is, is, is compromised because of that. So I try and cover it just with the antibiotic to eliminate uh, secondary infection, but the corticosteroid really eliminates the itching and the inflammation very effectively because you want to try and get them to stop rubbing. That is like the most, most important thing. And then you want to reduce the inflammation and stop the scarring from progressing. So that is, that is the key factors because these kids, and especially in a picture like this one, the vision is very bad. You can have them drop all the way down to 660, 6120, purely because of the bad um, epithelial damage that has been created just from the rubbing force on that eye. Now, topical immunomodulatory drops are very effective and obviously long-term more safer than uh, corticosteroids, but they are difficult to get. So in South Africa, we do not have a cyclosporin or something like that that is already labeled. Um, we have to compound them and they become a, very expensive as well. So in the public sector and rural sector environment, it becomes almost impossible for these patients to access those drops just because of a cost factor. And then the cold compress. That is your, that is your secret weapon when it comes to allergic and it comes to a rubbing, and especially kids with rubbing. Train the parents to use ice packs or cold packs or whatever to make that ocular surface as cold as possible because that will stop the itching, which will stop them from rubbing the eyes. Now, in this case, you will see them every week um, until you have the ocular surface or the SPK clearing up. Um, then you'll start tapering the steroid and you will try and find the lowest uh, strength drop that you can use to maintain them or to keep them stable. So if you start at a, at a full uh, corticosteroid and you drop it down to a 0.2% corticosteroid um, and you drop it down to an antihistamine, but the antihistamine makes all the symptoms come back, then you have to keep them on that 0.2% steroid or the immunomodulatory drop to keep them stable because you need to try and avoid um, the scarring from happening. And guys, I know I keep stressing this, but I see, I probably see one to two children a week who has such bad corneal scarring that they can't, um, that they can't function, they're legally blind because of it. And it's, it's so sad and it's not necessary. We really can keep this under control and get them just through puberty and out of their teens. And then this thing starts to quiet down and it starts to eliminate itself. And then by that stage, you can actually, um, you know, try and manage them a little bit differently from there. Okay. I normally see these, these patients every three months. So once I've put them on maintenance drops, I see them like once a month. And if I'm happy, I will review them every three months. And I will keep a very, very close eye on them because things change with them very quickly. Um, and then if I feel I need to see them more often, I can at least have a handle on it um, because you want to make sure that these kids just don't fade out um, and get lost in the system. And then the last one is viral conjunctivitis. Now, viral conjunctivitis next to allergic is the second most common conjunctivitis you'll see, not bacterial, okay? 
Now, I, remember, I said I will differentiate those three from each other. So with viral, what you get is you get the redness, very similar to bacterial, quite, quite red. You get a teary eye and the foreign body sensation. But what you get with viral that you don't get with bacterial is the itchiness. Viral conjunctivitis very often is very itchy. So it has got the itching component of allergic but it's got the redness and um, the, 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 almost the discharge component of bacterial. It's not quite as mucopurulent, it's actually a little bit more mucoidal, but it's got this itchiness and it's almost more itchy than um, allergic conjunctivitis, okay? And obviously the follicles are the key uh, component and you want to check your preauricular nodes, the nodes, lymph nodes in front of the ear. Um, I have not found that to be very effective, especially with kids. They don't really give you the feedback that you want, um, but the itching and the redness is a, a key component. And a lot of times these are kids more so than adults or elderly with bacterial, and they have an associated um, upper respiratory tract infection, maybe a little bit of a runny nose, maybe a little bit of a sore throat, so that is the, the, the key thing. So the parent will come in and say, oh, my child has got this one, you know, red eye and they've got a bit of a runny nose and that. And then that's quite um, indicative of a viral conjunctivitis. Now, viral is highly contagious. So you have to educate the parent to um, wash hands, wash the child's hands, change the pillowcase every morning so that they don't transfer. And the chances that they're going to get it on the other eye is almost 100%, but you want to try and eliminate the rest of the household um, to get it as well. And the child will then be um, asked to stay home from school. Otherwise, they will also give it to other kids at school. Hmm. So again, here we're looking at the cold compress and the lid wipes. Again, remember this is an infectious condition. So these are cold compresses, but you want to be able to have them to be discarded. Again, the cold is there to help with the itching. So to eliminate um, that itching, the artificial tears is there to try and reduce the viral load. So viruses, and especially in this case, adenovirus, and maybe now these days, maybe COVID as well, um, you want to try and eliminate the viral load in the ocular surface. And the only way to do that is to put artificial tears in there to try and flush out the virus that is in that eye. Uh, the topical antihistamine drops is for a comfort and to help reduce the itchiness. And now the last one there is quite an interesting one, which is topical propimidine. <laughs> now topical propimidine, uh, we get it in, uh, it's called broline. Uh, broline is a broad spectrum antimicrobial drop. So what it does is it's not specifically an antibacterial, it's an antimicrobial drop. And I have found, even though it does not um, actively kill adenovirus, it does tend to help reduce the infectious time span. So where you give a patient only artificial tears and antihistamine, this will normally take at least 10 days to resolve. Where with broline or propamidine, you can actually reduce that in half. The child will start um, relieving symptoms by day four or five, where that's almost double if you do not um, give them that. So that's been something that I've kind of uh, been playing around with and it really does work very effectively. Now, follow up is not needed unless the symptoms get worse. And a like I said, recovery should take up to about two weeks. These, child, these children or these people are isolated for two weeks to avoid them um, you know, spreading it around. Okay, so that's been a mouthful. That is the end of um, the two sections I wanted to leave you guys with. But uh, before I finish off, I have a, a little bit of a gift and a surprise for the guys listening uh, to this. I will be making this available for at least about two weeks. So those that's listening to the recording, you can also um, have access to this. So Guru Med, uh, like what you said earlier on, is a training platform that I created in lockdown. We present a lot of clinical training on this platform, mainly with a practical focus. So the idea is that this has to be implementable in practice. Um, three of the main courses on there is a big uh, section on dry eye and uh, building a dry eye clinic and how to actually go about doing that. And then this uh, presentation that I've just done there, the anterior segment, I do uh, uh, those pathology lectures in great detail. 
um, on my anterior segment pathology lecturer as well. But we've got a couple of new ones coming and there's some great speciality contact lens courses coming as well. But for you guys, I wanted to leave you with a present and um, there will be a 75% promotion on every course on GuruMed uh, for this group. Um, there's the promo code. So when you go to the website and um, I will actually uh, drop the website in the chat box. So when you go to the website, you can actually go to any one of the courses and you will be able to um, you know, uh, access that course and have it at a 75% discount uh, when you use this promo code, this one here. Oh, no, I can't show you. But anyway, that 75% promo, you'll just enter that into the promo code area on the website and you will be able to have that at a much reduced rate. So I will pop that into the chat box just now. Right, that is well, me. Th thanks a lot. Uh, it was a great lecture with a very nice uh, presentation. I congratulate you about that. It's, it's really, uh, I enjoyed the, the presentation and uh, the infographic uh, aspects were wonderful. Uh, I, 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 I know that Jeff Ronducci is online. Is that right, Jeff? Well, I don't know if he... Uh, so, if you have questions for my friends, francophone, you can always ask des questions. We will try to translate in the best way possible. J'espère qu'on aura quelques questions quand même, parce que dans la discussion, il y a deux messages que je vais voir tout de suite. Alors ça, c'est la promo, promo, le, le, uh, promo code of, your, uh, what you, of the offer for 75% uh, discount. OK, you can uh, see it in the chat uh, box. I will just record it. Là. Uh, well, you, you have, uh, you have entered this as uh, in the, in the, some aspects which are, uh, which, which we are uh, uh, seeing every day because uh, uh, leads and ocular surface are such important uh, uh, aspects uh, uh, that which, 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 is, which are linked with the a lot of pathologies and uh, for, for me as a, a contact lens uh, professional it, it's really uh, i enjoy it because I, I i when i am trying to fit some people uh, on lenses uh, such as clear lenses or even soft lenses i will always have a look at uh, at uh, the annexes the lids at uh, uh, several aspects of the lids and uh, also at uh, at the, uh, the ocular surface. So it, it, it's, I enjoyed this lecture because it has uh, been uh, really a really refreshing course for me. Thank and, you. Uh, so I, I don't know if it, th th there are some people who, who would like to, to ask about... No, it, any it, it was welcome. Re really clear that uh, I, I think you, you have been, uh, you have been uh, quite... Uh, a good lecturer today. There are few questions. I think I don't, I don't know. I, I, I am allowing all people to 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 use their phones. Huh? You guys are welcome to um, you know to contact me. You might have me on Facebook, and um, yeah, you're welcome to pop me a message. If there's any questions, um, you're very much welcome to to pop me a question. Um, otherwise, I'm yeah, I'll see you guys in the in the next one when we're doing uh, corneal and trauma, which is going to be quite quite a nice yeah. session. It it would be in uh, the 12th of May, uh, 2022. Uh, at the same time, uh, it it was about a. Uh, a trauma uh, about uh, trauma aspects uh, as a uh, insults of uh, coronary uh, insults and uh, trauma. I didn't see a lot of things about uh, keratitis today. Don't know. Uh, yeah, so the keratitis will fall within the corneal section. So um, it's a lot of material to cover. So in um, cornea, there's actually about there's almost twenty conditions. 
um, where things like viral then goes into epidemic keratoconjunctivitis and vernal goes into vernal keratoconjunctivitis. So where the cornea is much more involved and we'll, we'll, we'll do a big section on, on corneal involvement with a lot of this that we've sp spoken about today will actually be pulled into that as well. So we'll get into the keratitis um, next time. Okay, then if there is someone who could ask a question or so, otherwise, no, no. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions avant de libérer Marie-Jé à ses occupations? Parce qu'en ce moment, il est 19h25 en Afrique du Sud. Uh, you are ahead of us, of, uh, one hour ahead of us, I think. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, you, you you could drop your uh, email address so uh, if people would like to send some comments or some questions. I'll do that in the chat box now. Then you guys can um, just email me if you uh, if you need anything. Okay. Okay, that's uh, so, so simple. That's uh, Marie G at. Uh, at the, at the website, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. I think that, that, that there are no questions uh, today, so uh, uh, I, I will have a look again at the, uh, the handout. I might send you some questions. I have heard some when someone. Uh, so. Uh, Thanks a lot, Marie J, and uh, hope to see you soon. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, I will wish you a, a nice end of the week uh, and uh, uh, keep well. And uh, that, that's all. Huh? So, so I am asking people to do their best. The, uh, the Omicron is uh, quite uh, frequently present today. Uh, I, 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 have, I have been very sick. I, I have been affected by uh, the COVID-19, uh, and I know that it's not uh, it's not a simple thing. So uh, keep well and uh, uh, distanciation uh, and so on, mask and so on. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We'll see you guys next time. Okay. Bye. 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 Yeah.